Mark, how you doing? I'm great, Michael. How are you guys? We're doing great. Is this just a fan thing, or is it the Yankees really, really don't want to see the Red Sox celebrate on their turf? <laughs> um, it's more of a fan thing, honestly. When you know, I, I've been on the field for you know, different points, whether whether a team clinches a playoff berth or whether whether you lose a playoff series, so they're clinching that and celebrating. You, you run off the field, and in 30 seconds, you, as a player, you're done. So it doesn't, I mean, it hurts losing as a player. You never want to lose a game, any any game you play. But I think it's way more of a fan thing. Can you imagine 50,000, especially if it's a close game, right? You know, two nights ago, if, if the Yankees would have blown that lead at the end with Britain throwing the ball around, that would have been a, a gut punch to Yankee fans. You know, 50,000 people watching the Red Sox you know, spraying champagne on their field. So I think it's definitely more for the fans. Now, it's amazing. I'm trying to think really in any sport, Mark, and you follow sports, that you can have a pitcher like David Price who's really, really good. But the bigger the stage, the harder he falls, whether it's the postseason, whether it's the Yankees. And let's face it, Yankee Red Sox, people are paying attention to that. He flat out cannot beat the Yankees, especially at the stadium. It's got to be psychological, right? Yeah, I think there's some sort of mental block when, when he gets onto the mound at Yankee Stadium. And, you know, baseball is such a confidence sport. You have to be confident when you're in the box, you're on that mound. You're in complete control of the game. But if you're off a little bit, especially at Yankee Stadium, you're leaving balls out over the plate. Those right hands are hitting home runs the other way. It can spin out of control quickly. And, you know, Price actually looked pretty good the first few innings. But, um you know, the, the, the demons of Yankee Stadium got to him again. And you got to think that with the season that he's had, he's had a really good season. It's mental with the Yankees. Luke Voigt got him twice, porched him twice. Um, is, is Voigt for real? And do the Yankees now go into next year thinking Voigt's their first baseman and not Bird? Uh, isn't that crazy? Just, just hearing yeah. you say that, Michael, is, is crazy. But if you think about it, you know, people look at a big, strong Luke Boyd, you know, you're not very fast, not you're not necessarily a, a five-tool type player, but he's got a nice short swing. And he's not a guy who just kind of slips up for the fences, you know, strikes out every, you know, every other at-bat. He puts together really good at-bats. Yeah, he's going to strike out because he's got a pretty good eye, but he's going to walk, and he's going to hit those home runs to right field. And, you know, he's, he's as strong as anybody in baseball. And if you actually give him 500 at bat, heck, he could hit 30 plus home runs. You know, um, I worry a little bit about him getting overexposed. A little bit like what happened with Austin Romine this year. You know, Austin Romine filled in really well for Gary, but when your book gets bigger in, in, in this game, they will find your holes. And when you only have a couple hundred at bats, you know, one or two hundred at bats under your belt at the big league level. You know, those at, at analytics department doesn't have enough information on you. I would be interested to see 500 at bats if Luke Voigt's holes were exposed mm -hmm. a little bit more. Do the analytics tell you how important Neil Walker is to this team? He, he's so important. You know, that signing, uh, one of the most underrated signings of the offseason. It didn't pay off for the first four months. It, you know, Neil Walker, he didn't have a he didn't have a spring training. He's behind the eight ball. He wasn't getting consistent at bats. He was playing multiple different positions, but he handled it like a pro every step of the way. And now, when I go into the playoffs, and I'm a, you know, you're going to have interesting situations come up, whether it's a defensive replacement, whether it's a pinch runner needed, you know, whatever it might be. He fills a, a role for this Yankees team in the postseason that is super valuable and um, you know, obviously the big three run homer the other night the guy can hit he, he's a professional hitter he's going to put up good at bats um, and, and he's been big for this team the last few weeks now one of the guys on this team that was an ex-teammate of yours and I'm sure that it's a very very difficult thing for Aaron Boone to do but it looks like Brett Gardner is now a bench player because they like what McCutcheon has done. And the fact that he did not start Gardner against Evaldi spoke volumes to me. And, and you know, moments ago when he spoke, met with the media, they, they asked what McCutcheon would be in the playoffs. And Boone said he's going to be a dude for us. And that's Boone speak, that he's going to play a lot. How tough do you think this is for Gardner and for the Yankees to do this to Gardner? You know what? I don't think it's as tough as, as you think, Michael. And this is why. Brett Gardner has been the ultimate... 
uh, kind of grinder, warrior type player since the since his rookie year. He's never been a guy that um, you know the Yankees have uh, have had to lean on for. Hey, you're going to carry our team this week or this month. He's just kind of fit the role wherever you put him, and I think because of that. He's going to look at this opportunity and go, you know what? Do I wish I was starting? Absolutely. But I'm going to get some at-bats in the postseason. I'm going to, I'm going to get you know, maybe a couple pinch running uh, appearances. I'm going to play some outfield here and there. And I'm going to do everything I can to help this team win. He's that type of guy. This is, this is much different if you had to sit, you know, remember when Alex Rodriguez got yeah. benched during the playoffs in 2012. Totally different situation here. And uh, I think Brett Gardner is, is enough of a professional. I think Aaron Boone is, you know, when he comes and talks to Brett Gardner about his role, I'm sure those are great conversations. And Gardy's saying, all right, Booney, whatever you need from me, I'm going to be there for you. Now, they'll bench Gardner. They've benched Bird. They've taken and Duhar out for defense late. They really don't play that game with Sanchez. Is that right, Mark? Do you think that they're treating him a little bit with kid gloves? Do they think that maybe psychologically it would bother him if they were to bench him or take him out late for defense? Well, I think the reason that they're doing that with Sanchez is that his ceiling is still the best catcher in baseball. And after this season, you may have to kind of – to, to relook at, at his career and, and maybe reset those expectations. But Gary Sanchez's ceiling, when healthy, is you can be the best catcher in baseball. And I don't think Greg Bird's ceiling is the best first baseman in baseball. I don't think, you know, Brett Gardner's ceiling is the best left fielder in baseball. And so I, I, I think that the Yankees are probably doing the right thing here, saying, hey, Gary, we think you're great. We're going to keep you in there. Show us that you're great. Now, we ask you this every Thursday, and it's a fluid question. That's why we ask you every Thursday. And I don't know if you feel this way. I thought that Severino looked as close to vintage yesterday as he has since the, since the All-Star break. Who's your wild card starter? It's still Tanaka. It, it's still, I, just, I just feel really good about that. You know, uh, I watch the games on Yes, you know, almost every night, and, and you guys always talk about it. Listen, this is going to be a bullpen game for the wild card anyway. As soon as... Whoever the starter is, as soon as there are, you know, a few guys on, second, third, fourth, you know, whatever inning it is, early innings, and Booney and Larry Rothschild think that it's time to go to the pen, they're making that call. So I still like Tanaka's upside. Tanaka can give you three or four innings, you know, throwing that split down in the dirt and, and, and not giving up any hits. Whereas, you know, Seve, we've seen he can blow up, you know, in, in a couple innings. I think Hap is, is probably your game one starter, and I almost rather have that type of, of, of backup where Hap can now go twice in the in the first round if he has to, mm -hmm. because you know he's been second half of the season since the Yankees have gotten him. He's been their best pitcher. Yeah, uh, we talk. I still like Tanaka for. Yeah, I, I, like, I like Tanaka for a few innings. That's that's what I that's what I see for that wild card game. Now, we talk about the unfairness of one game and done in the wild card, right? Well, last year's third place wild card team was under 500. Tampa Bay is going to win 90 plus games, Mark, and miss the playoffs. <laughs> it's just, I mean, how, how would you feel in that organization? If you're cash, if you're the guys that play for Tampa, how much pride can you take in a non playoff season? You can, and I'll go back to the 2004 Texas Rangers. We were expected to be a last place team. Um, it was the year that you know Alex Rodriguez gets traded to the to the Yankees. All of our veterans, you know, either sign somewhere else or get traded. We had a bunch of young players, and then a bunch of old guys that were at the end of their career. And we went out and won 89 games. We were in it until the last weekend of the season, and we left that season feeling good about ourselves, feeling like, hey, you know what, we're building something here. Now, we ended up not being able to capitalize on that and, and kind of went back to a 500 team the next year. But this Tampa Bay team knows that they're good. They know that they have talent. They know that they can, um, you know, they can win close games. And so, yeah, are, are, they, are they as talented as the Yankees or Red Sox? They're not. Their payroll is half of what the Yankees and Red Sox spend, and they, they can still feel good about this year. These first two games, uh, and this is not like overreaction Monday or Tuesday in football, and I've, I've watched them all year. I think the Red Sox are a great team. 
but there's a flaw in this team, Mark, to me, that can rear its ugly head in the postseason. They have a very rickety bridge from starter to Kimbrell. I'm not sure that this team, as great as it is, is a World Series winning team because of that. I agree, and I've gone back and forth um, between the Astros and the Red Sox. Who's the best team in the American League? And I think we can all agree that the, the, the body of work that the Red Sox have put together this year is really impressive. You know, anytime you win, you know, 100, you know 110 plus games, you're a great team. But in a seven game series with the right handed pitchers that the Astros have versus the Red Sox, with the amount of damage that the Astros can do, as you said, Michael, late into a game, you know what? I still think the Astros are a better team. And the Yankees, if they win, if they have a home game against the, uh, the A's, they win that game. Now you got J.A. Happ going, you know, game one in Boston, and the Yankees have some momentum from winning that first game, and the Red Sox haven't played a meaningful game in three weeks. It could be advantage Yankees. I mean, I would not be surprised if the Yankees went into Boston and won one or two games there to start that five-game series. I look at it this way, Mark, with the Yankees. If they get past a wild card, they're in as good a shape as if they won the American League East because of the fact they're built for the postseason. They have three really good starters, and they have an outstanding bullpen if Chapman is what Chapman is. You're exactly right. The only caveat is that is they, they, it would still be great if they had home field advantage. We know how good the Yankees were at home last year. They seem to not be able to score runs on the road. You know, right. so um, I would say that the Yankees on a neutral, you know, all things being equal, they're as good as anybody. But to have, having to go into Boston and then either you know, Cleveland or Houston – might be a little bit tougher for them. Uh, they feel a lot better if they were at Yankee Stadium for, for four out of seven or three out of five. Oh, we're talking with Mark to share his weekly spot on the show. Mark, I've got some text messages for you. This is from Gene. He says, I'm usually a Cashman fan, but I think he missed on the Stanton trade. His numbers don't justify his contract. Stanton is signed until 2027. He has a full no trade clause and might only accept a trade to the Dodgers. Should the Yankees look to trade him this offseason? It's a really good question. I think the Yan I think Brian Cashman has proven that he's always open for business. And if if the Yankees feel that you know Bryce Harper could come to New York, or they feel that there's some other uh, opening that they can they can trade Stanton, they might look at it. But the fact of the matter is, is young Carlos Stanton is still one of the best power hitters in baseball. Anybody's first year in New York is usually a tough transition. You know, I got lucky that you know. I got on a good roll in May and, and you know, had a, had a really good season. We won the World Series. But that, that's not typical. You know, most, most guys that go from a small market like the Marlins to New York, there's a little bit of an adjustment period. And I think Stanton's handled, handled himself fine. The contract will be judged in the last few years. And everyone's going to say, ah, oh, it was a terrible sign. Why'd Cashman do that? But the fact is, if the Yankees win a World Series with Giancarlo Stanton in that lineup, it was worth it. And and everybody knows that that lineup is better right now with Stanton in it. Um, we've proven, you know, the, the Yankees have proven that they can win games without Aaron Judge. And one of the reasons is because Stanton is still a stud. This is from John from Oakhurst. Can Gary Sanchez's defense be corrected? Does he need his eyes checked at this point as he misses strikes as well as balls in the dirt? I don't. I don't think it's his eyes because this is one of the best hitters when he's right. Um, but you know, why not? <laughs> let's let's make sure we get Gary a uh, you know an eye doctor. But I just think this is one of the, this is such a tough year for Gary for a lot of reasons. He's going to have to really work hard this off season and attack some of the issues that he's had and go into next year with kind of that eye of the tiger. Um, a lot of people talk about his low motor and blah blah blah. He needs to come out next spring training almost feeling like he has to win a job, almost feeling like he has to prove himself again because you know, no matter how he finishes the last week and a half this season, the numbers are going to be ugly offensively and defensively. All right, before we let you go, on this date, September 20th, who are your World <laughs> Series teams at this point? <laughs> you guys love doing this to me. It's, oh, the, yeah. it's the Astros and the Cubs. The Astros and the Cubs. And, and at this point in the season, the reason I say that is, they are both relatively healthy, and on paper, talent-wise, they have the best rosters. 
So I can't tell you who's going to get hot on October 1st or 2nd, but health and talent right now, go. the edge goes to the Astros and the Cubs. Great stuff. We'll talk to you next week, Mark.